So, this is lecture 36 and we were doing a problem on the design of a natural gas burner for uh, cooking, community cooking application. And you already have the data with you that you want to place the ports on 160 millimeter diameter circle and it must deliver 2.2 kilowatt at full load and operate at 40 percent primary aeration. Port loading should not be more than 10 watt per millimeter squared and the full load flame height should not be more than 20 mm. So, these were the constraints that we were working with. So, since it is a design kind of thing, what we did yesterday was actually try and get some numbers for these two, for the number of ports and the diameter of the port. Okay. So, there are multiple holes as we understand through which the fuel air mixture will come out, air with 40 percent of the theoretical requirement. And what we did yesterday was assume this number 36 for n and get d as 2.79 mm and uh, this could be obtained because 2200 watt that is 2.2 .2 kilowatt had to be distributed in all those ports subject to the fact that the maximum port loading that is at 2200 watt should be just 10 watt per millimeter squared not more than that. So, we had actually got N d squared as 280 millimeter squared from that we got these two. So, we are doing this example 9.4 from Turns's book. So, 2.79 seems reasonable. It is not very large and uh, in any case you are not fully premixing the methane that is the natural gas with air. This is a natural gas burner and in the problem he has taken this natural gas to be methane. Not exactly correct, right? The natural gas that you get from gas wells that does not have only methane, it has other things also. It may have other hydrocarbons also for example. It can, methane can be 95 percent, but it also depends on which source you are looking at. There are sources in the world where methane percentage is low. In fact, if you are getting methane from a particular well for several years, maybe the methane percentage will come down. There are um, gas sources in the world where the methane percentage can be 60 percent, 70 percent also. So, it is not exactly correct, but again remember that we are doing a course, we are not doing a full fledged problem solving. Okay. So, this is taken to be natural gas is taken to be approximated to be CH4. So, once we have done that, what else do we need to do? We need to think about whether this d equal to 2.8 mm and number of 36, whether this is going to satisfy the constraints that we have, because we already have some constraints. For example, one constraint is the flame length. Now, in order to do all that, we understand that we will need flow rates your flame length should not be more than 20 mm. Now, how do you go to flame length? Through calculation of flow rates, right? Because we understand something about flame lengths now. We understand the flame length will be proportional to the flow rate, but the flow rates are not given. So, the burner operating parameters are given 2.2 .2 kilowatt at full load and uh, we have got the port diameter, but we do not have the flow rates. So, we have to go to the flow rates, from the flow rates we have to check the flame length. That is going to be our mode of action. That is the path that we are going to take. So, this is like the first step, step 1. And then we are going to do step 2, where we will try to get different flow rates. So, the simplest thing to do first is to write m dot f into delta h c as 2200 0 watt. That is a limiting fuel flow rate and uh, we can use delta h c for methane and then that will give us m dot f of 4.4 10 to the power minus 5 kg per second. So, we get delta h c for methane from the book. We go to the back of the book and just take the take the value of delta H C. 
And once we have m dot f, we can also get m dot a primary. Is that important? Yeah, 40 percent has been given. So, we can calculate m dot a primary. So, we can calculate this by doing something like this. We can say 0.4 air fuel ratio stoichiometric times m dot fuel. Because that is 40 percent of the stoichiometric requirement. So, if you do that, air fuel ratio stoichiometric is actually 17.1. So, this is 0 0.4, 17.1 into 4.4 .4, 10 to the power minus 5, this many kgs per second. All right. So, this is the m dot f of course, multiplied by that 0.4 and multiplied by the air fuel ratio. So, we got m dot a primary. So, that m dot a primary works out to be 3.01 into 10 to the power minus 4 kg per second. So, what are we interested in? We are actually interested in this q dot through the port. Why? Because that will take us to the flame length, correct? So, q dot total Mind you, even though in the flame length formula we have been writing q dot f, it is actually the flow rate through the port. So, even if it is fuel plus something else, you know, it is even if it is fuel plus nitrogen or maybe fuel plus some amount of primary air, we still have to calculate the fuel flow through the port. Okay. So, the q dot f coming out of the port is important to calculate the flame length. So, what I am trying to say is that the notation q dot f should not confuse you. If, if it is fuel plus something else, with the book still uses q dot f. So, q dot total is m dot a primary plus m dot f divided by a rho bar. And uh, chi a primary, there can be chi a primary that uh, one can use. So, that will be 3.81 divided by 3.81. I will uh, I'll tell you what is 3.81. x plus y by 4. So, this is the mole fraction uh, which we need for calculating the density. Okay. Calculating the molecular weight and hence the density. So, what is uh, 3.81? 3.81 is this quantity. Okay, Let us go one by one. This we got from the last page. Q dot total we will need and to get Q dot total, what do we have now? We have m dot f, is not it? 4.4 into 10 to the power minus 5 kg per second. We have m dot a primary which is that 3.01 into 10 to the power minus 4 kg per second. Notice that your m dot a primary is of the order of 10 to the power minus 4 whereas fuel is of the order of 10 to the power minus 5. So, even though you are giving only 40 percent of the stoichiometric requirement of air, it is still more than an order of magnitude higher than the fuel flow rate. That is obvious, no? fuel is always small. But you should check such things because only then you will know whether what you are doing is correct or not. All right, coming back to this, we have m dot f, we also have m dot a primary. We have calculated that. But we need q total, that is our objective because this will give us the flame length. For that, we need a density. Okay, density of this uh, air fuel mixture which we are sending out through the nozzle. To get that density, we need the molecular weight, we will use ideal gas. So, we will use the fuel air mixture molecular weight, right? In ideal gas equation to get the density. So, to get that uh, mixture molecular weight, we need to have the mole fractions. 
Okay. So, mole fraction of air can be of this primary air can be calculated like this. So, you understand why it is 3.81 divided by 3.81 plus 1, what is this 1? Fuel. Fuel. Okay. So, we are writing methane plus uh, this much amount of air, methane plus this much amount of air in the stream which is coming out of the nozzle. So, this 1 is for fuel. So, 3.81 divided by uh, this is actually 0 0.792. 3.81 is this thing. This is the stoichiometric, uh, stoichiometric number of moles of air and we are giving 40 percent of that. So, that gives you 3.81. That is for one mole of fuel. So, that is why this one here. Okay. Now, chi fuel will be 1 minus chi air primary and uh, that is 0 0.208. So, that is from here, right. We know this to be 0 0.792. So, 1 minus 0 0.792. So, we get this 0 0.208. Now, we are in a position to get the molecular weight of the mixture. So, the molecular weight of the mixture is 0 0.792 into the air molecular weight plus 0 0.208 into the methane molecular weight. Is it okay to multiply molecular weight by mole fractions or should we have multiplied molecular weights by mass fractions? Mole fraction is okay. What is the unit of the quantity W mix? Kg per kilo mole, right? Kg per kilo mole. What is the unit of this? No unit. And this is Kg per kilo mole. The units are matching, but should this be mole fraction or mass fraction? How do we know? Yeah, so think about it small fraction that is correct, but uh, mass fraction also does not have unit. So, if you put mass fraction here, this should still have satisfied this. Okay. So, check this out. I, I mentioned this because sometimes we are thinking about all these conservation equations and stuff like that, but this basic stuff also needs to be kept in mind. So, W mix will turn out to be 26.19 from here. And then we get rho bar. We know the mass flow rate coming out of the nozzle. We need the density. So, that density will come from ideal gas. So, we will write 101325, 8315, 26.19, 300. So, this gives us 1.064 kg per meter cube, correct. So, this is P by R characteristic, this is the characteristic gas constant. So, this is the universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight of the mixture which we have just now calculated and this is the temperature. So, this gives you 1.064 kg per cubic meter. So, we are now in a position to get Q total. So, this Q total is 3.01 10 to the power minus 4 plus 4.4 .4 10 to the power minus 5 divided by 1.064. What are these two? m dot air, primary air and this is m dot fuel okay. divided by rho bar. So, this gives us 3.24 into 10 to the power minus 4 meter cubed per second. So, that is our step 2. Step 2, we needed this flow rates. We needed actually that Q total, volumetric flow rate. We needed the, the volumetric flow rate. Mass flow rate was the first step. So, this is step 2 of our work. Now, we 
go to a step 3 which is to do what? What should we do now? All right. So, we have a design. We have these number of holes n equal to 36. We have a diameter of 2.79 mm. We have flow rates. We have the mass flow rates of fuel, mass flow rate of air and also the primary air and also the volumetric flow rate, the total volumetric flow rate which is coming from the tube. All right. Now, what else? What should we do now? Yeah, so we should check the flame length constraint right now. To get the flame length constraint, do we use Q dot total directly? We have this uh, 3.24 into 10 to the power minus 4 meter cube per second. So, should we get the flame length for this flow rate? No. So, we have to divide it by the number of ports, is not it? And the number of ports we already have some number, we have 36. So, Q port is Q total divided by n, which is 3.24 10 to the power minus 4 divided by 36, which is 9 into 10 to the power minus 6 meter cube per second. This is what will determine the length of the flame on a particular port. If we use the total flow rate, then the flame would have been very tall. So, how do we now get uh, the flame length? We will need S and which relation do we use for S based on the discussion that we had yesterday? Okay, the one with the psi prime, psi primary actually. So, it is 1 minus psi primary written as psi p r i and this is psi p r i plus 1 divided by s pure and that is that gives you 1 minus 0 0.4 divided by 0 0.4 plus 1 over 9.52 which gives you 1.19. So, that can give you the flame length. Now, we are in a position to get the flame length. So, 1330 Qf, this is what we do, this is log. And we have everything now. And it so happens that this turns out to be 0 0.0196 meters, which is 19.6 mm. So, the guess was really nice that nine, n equal to 36 that worked out perfectly. Of course, in real life, you may not be that, uh, that fortunate, that lucky all the time. So, you will do some design with some value of n, then it may, may not work out and depending on the flame length that you get, then you can change the value of n, is not it? So, if the flame is 25 mm, what do we have to do? You have to increase n, so that will decrease d because your n d squared is a constant thing, right? So, d will become smaller and uh, there will be larger number of ports. Because there are larger number of ports, there will be less flow rate through each port and the flame length will come down. So, that is what we have to do. So, this is a textbook example. Of course, you may have to do something more than this. <coughs> and uh, in the book, Tans also checks for the spacing between the ports. Okay, so, there is a 160 millimeter diameter and uh, he checks the spacing between the ports because if you arrange all these 36 ports on this one with uniform spacing, 
you can do a simple geometrical calculation to see what is the spacing between the ports and that turns out to be 14 mm. Okay. So, why does he do that? Because if the um, ports are too close then that is not such a nice thing because the flames will merge and things like that. But he also concludes that uh, with 14 mm spacing between the individual ports, he is doing okay. All right. So, this gives you a flavor of how to do these calculations. Is there any reason why do we have multiple rings of the ports rather than single? Yeah, so it it can give you it can help you distribute the heat in different stages. So it can it can it can make maybe the distribution of heat more uniform instead of giving it over on one circle. If you give two circles, the distribution will be better. That sort of consideration. Size can be reduced because if we have been one circle, the size has to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that that is also there. So his question was, why do we have multiple circles? <coughs> In this example, there was only one circle. Plus, what we understand from here is that if uh, blindly we wanted to give all the flow rates through one port, that would have been a disaster. In that case, the flame length would have been very large. So that means. In the design stage, you choose the diameter in such a way and distribute the flow in such a way that you have some control over the flame length because you are typically using this for heating. So, you do not want the flame length to be too small or too large, things like that. So, you can have a control over the flame length. Okay, just uh, one or two other things about diffusion flames. So, what you may have seen in the book probably is that in diffusion flame there is a, this problem of soot generation and I mentioned this some time back. I, I said that uh, it is not so much of a problem in premixed flames because in a premixed flame the fuel molecules get enough oxygen nearby whereas in a diffusion flame fuel, there is a fuel side and there is an oxidizer side. Even though there is some leakage of oxidizer to the fuel side then there is some leakage of fuel to the oxidizer side. In the fuel side, it is mainly fuel, in the oxidizer side, there is mainly oxygen. So, the fuel can uh, get heated to higher temperature and it can break down, it can produce some chemical species which can go on to form soot okay, on the fuel side. And uh, it can do that easily in a non premixed flame because it is not getting attacked by oxygen when this is happening when the fuel is breaking down and trying to form soot, it is not getting attacked by oxygen because there is not enough oxygen in the fuel side. So, there is more chance that a non premix flame will produce soot. And um, we can take a look at just very briefly, we can take a look at uh, what happens in a flame. So, please spend a minute looking at this particular plot. So, this is this gives you radial profiles of temperature and scattered light. Now, what is meant by scattered light is that if you have a laser light shining on the flame, then that laser light can actually scatter some part or some part of the light. Okay. So, he is plotting some intensity, some quantity related to the light which is scattered and temperature on these two axes. For a flame where you have the burner here and it is an axisymmetric flame. So, this is radial. This is the burner, this is the top of the burner. Burner is like this. So, the fuel air mixture is coming out like this and what you see here, these points correspond to temperature. And the temperature shows this kind of a profile. Okay. This is the radial coordinate, this is the radial position. So, what is R equal to 0? Center line of the burn. R equal to 0 is the center line of the burn. So, again, flow coming like this, along this is the center line. And this is R going from 0 to 10, this is R going from 0 to minus 10. So, what do you expect in such a case? 
you expect profiles to be axisymmetric. In reality, there may be some little variation, but it is expected to be axisymmetric. So, is that happening? If you look at temperature, this is temperature. Is it happening? The temperatures are like 500, 1000, 1500, 2000 Kelvin. Is it symmetric? Yes. And uh, can we interpret this profile properly? Like, why is it low here and why does it go up and what happens here and after that it again goes down? What, what is all this? Yeah, so at the center line, the temperature is lower, but as you move radially outwards, of course, this temperature profile is at a certain height. <laughs> so, if you move radially outwards, the temperature keeps on increasing. And here at this location, which is more like maybe a little more than 5 or 6 here, millimeter radial position, you get the maximum temperature. And you can see that roughly at the same location, you can get the maximum temperature on the other side also. So, this is where we probably have the flame, all right. Why probably? Definitely we have the flame around here and then the temperature comes down because then you are moving away from the flame going more towards the oxidizer side. So, you will see if you read, a, if you read some paper on diffusion flames or if you look at some data, the profiles will look like this. This is called a temperature profile because this is radial variation of temperature T as a function of R at a given x. So, it is expected to look like this. And this is a scattered light quantity which, which is, which relates to this axis here and uh, this also relates to the presence of soot. So, higher numbers here will mean higher volume of soot present in those, those, those zones. So, we will have some soot here and low soot in all this region, but you have a lot of soot in this region. Okay. And then the soot in fact comes down. So, what you can see from this plot is that the maximum soot occurs before the maximum temperature is reached maximum suit occurs before the maximum temperature is reached. So, what is happening is, this is the center line and the fuel will tend to diffuse towards the flame, fuel is, will tend to diffuse towards the flame. As it tends to diffuse towards the flame, the fuel also breaks down. This is called pyrolysis of the flame. So, the fuel molecule breaks down to lot of other things and uh, one idea that people usually present is that fuel breaks down to acetylene and then from that acetylene there are again a series of reactions ultimately you get a formation of soot. So, in the on its way to the flame zone, it breaks down to intermediate chemical species including acetylene and then it finally produces what are known as a soot precursor molecules. It produces soot precursors. So, what is a soot precursor? Precursor is something which happens before the main, main thing happens. Okay, so, these are chemical species which are not soot, but which will lead you to soot. And the most prominent precursor that people talk about is PAH. Now, PAH, is, PAH is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons is kind of like benzene ring molecules. Okay. So, there is acetylene and from acetylene there are some more reactions which will give you. So, the fuel may be ethylene, like in this example of the profile that you saw, fuel is in fact ethylene. And from that ethylene, you get acetylene and then at that acetylene actually goes gives you pH which is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. So, these are soot precursors, these are not soot particles. 
And then these there is some reaction and some chemical reaction and there is some physical growth of all these soot precursors which lead you to soot inception. Inception means starting, inception means beginning, correct. So, from precursors which are very tiny chemical species we get soot particles. These are called soot primary particles actually, soot inceptions means very small nano level soot particles and these soot particles also grow, so there is soot growth, growth agglomeration and then so there is physical growth of these soot particles and then also soot particles join each other such things happen and there is also soot oxidation. So, you get soot precursors as the first thing and the, the, then the soot precursors give you soot particles which are uh, at the soot inception stage very small primary particles and then the soot primary particles grow by some physical mechanisms, there is growth and there is also some chemical reaction so they get bigger. Okay. And we are not going into the details of this but uh, these soot particles which have grown to some extent they can also agglomerate, so they can connect with each other, they can form chains and things like that. So, if you see soot particles in a microscope, if you collect soot particles let us say from an engine exhaust or some combustor exhaust somewhere, you will not see one particle alone, you will see multiple particles joining each other and forming chains and then these soot particles all can also get oxidized. So, in the case of uh, laminar jet flame, Soot part, soot actually is mostly carbon, soot is something like 96 percent carbon and maybe about 3 or 4 percent hydrogen yeah. and uh, the nature of the soot particle does not depend strongly on the fuel that you have. So, whichever fuel you have, the soot particles are roughly that same mostly carbon, small amount of hydrogen that sort of thing. The nature of the soot particles are not dependent so much on the source. Okay. Hmm. No, 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 growing is not due to oxidation, growing is because of um, some species coming and joining and getting deposited on these primary particles and making those bigger and then some, chem some other chemical reactions also happening. So, there is physical and chemical effects both lead to, uh, both leading to larger size of soot particles. So, the primary soot particles which are uh, obtained in the inception stage, they get bigger, they get bigger by both physical and chemical mechanisms. So, that is growth and then finally, that though the soot particles can also get oxidized in a flame. So, that is a soot oxidation. Why is it glowing? Oh, glowing, achha, you, you, the question was on glowing, I thought it was on growing of soot particles. No, glow means uh, the soot particles are in the flame, so they are radiating, they are like carbon particles, they are radiating, they radiate in the infrared region, but they also radiate uh, kind of like a black body. Okay. So, their radiation is different from the radiation which you see from other chemical species in the flame. So, the bright yellow orangeish uh, orange uh, radiation which you see, <coughs> let us say for example, in a candle flame that comes from soot. So, if you have a candle flame and then some distance above that if you hold a piece of paper, then you will see that soot particles are going and depositing there, because it is a cold surface if you are not holding the paper for a long time, if you are holding the paper for a long time then there is more trouble, right. Uh, but uh, it is a cold surface and the soot particles can go and deposit there. So, it is actually the soot particles are breaking through the top of the flame. Now, that is for a candle flame, but it can also happen here as you can see here. You can see that the soot is actually, you can have a soot particle inception zone, you can have a growth zone, you can have a soot oxidation zone. So, you can have, uh, this is for a laminar jet flame, this is not for a candle flame. Okay, this is again taken from Turns's book. 
So towards the upper part of the flame, uh, soot gets oxidized. And that oxidation also releases some amount of heat, high temperatures, and then in that high temperature zone, soot particles also brightly radiate. So radiation from a non-premixed flame can be much more than radiation from a premixed flame because of the presence of soot. Methane, is, methane doesn't produce that much amount of soot, but then there are higher hydrocarbons which produce larger amount of soot. Okay, so the last plot which I had shown you with the scattered light profile and the temperature profile, that was for laminar ethylene jet diffusion flame, so ethylene. So ethylene will give you definitely much more suit than what methane can give you. And uh, looking at this, you can see that suit can break through from the top of the flame. So you at the top of the flame, if you see some wings like this, sometimes you must have seen there are wings on the top of the flame. Okay, actually this is uh, just a sketch, but maybe I should have shown you some photographs. That would have been even more helpful. But probably you can follow what I am saying that, that, that if the tip breaks like this and if the tip is not like this, then that means uh, some suit is actually breaking the, through the flame and going out and also subsequently getting oxidized. Some of them not getting oxidized, some of them just going out like that. So is suit uh, good or bad? Typically suit is not good because uh, this is particulate emission and particulate emission is uh, hazardous for health as we know and you know that uh, diesel vehicles have got a bad name because they produce more particulates. Okay. So diesel tends to produce soot. So they have got a bad name because uh, definitely in spite of all kinds of measures uh, having been taken, they, they still uh, release more particulates and they have problems. And uh, along with soot particles, there can be also this PAH, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons which get produced in this kind of combustion situation. So, those PAH uh, molecules can stick to the soot particles and then even those are PAH itself is hazardous to health sometimes. So, uh, these are some of the problems with soot. So, we will try to avoid soot as much as possible. but. Uh, Sometimes you sometimes you like soot. If you if you are using a flame for lighting applications, for example, if you are using a candle, then the you are not you don't use the candle to heat something, right? So you use a candle to light something. Because it's just we don't use candle every day, but all right. So if you are using it for lighting purposes, then of course it's if you it has it has more soot, so it radiates. So you can see that radiation. So you can it gives you more light. In turbulent non-premix non flames, the radiation which the soot takes out of the flame can be really high. So it can be something like 30 percent. So in non-premix flame, the energy which gets released because of combustion. So why are you doing this combustion? Why are you getting this flame? Because you want to release the chemical energy of the fuel in the form of thermal energy. But part of it will well actually can go out of the flame because of the radiation which is getting from the flame. Okay. So, in large uh, turbulent flames, okay, you can lose 20 percent of the energy let us say or maybe even 30 percent of the energy because of the radiation which is coming from the suit. So, there is a we can, we can define a radiative fraction which is the radiant energy which is going out because of the radiation from the suit divided by the chemical energy release. Okay. So, such things happen. I essentially pointed this out to tell you that uh, when we were doing premix flames, we are not talking so much about suit, but when we talk about non premix flame, suit is important sometimes. Okay. Now, we will in fact close the discussion on uh, diffusion flames, but diffusion flames, we will close the discussion of on diffusion flames of gaseous fuel. We will do that shortly, we will close the discussion, but after that we will go to other kinds of diffusion flame which is let us say liquid fuel combustion. Liquid fuel will typically burn in a diffusion mode because it is liquid, so it cannot get mixed with the 
oxygen of the air as such. So you, the liquid has to first evaporate. I think I probably told you at the beginning of the semester that you, the liquid has to evaporate, then the vapor has to go to air, meet the air and then burn. So you can understand that it, this will be non-premixed combustion. So we'll go to that uh, uh, maybe at the beginning of the next class. But before that, we just I just want to maybe spend a few minutes on mixture fraction. So as a as a review basically. So just one small ex example I like to take that not exactly example, mixture fraction, I think there was a question on uh, what this means, right. So one part of the meaning we saw that it is a conserved scalar, it is a passive scalar and uh, it is convenient in the sense that if you write the equation for the mixture fraction, it is not going to have a source term, that is why it is called a passive scalar, right. And that is an equation which is easy to solve. But then does it have uh, some meaning also? Actually, the meaning is easy to quite easy to establish if there is just mixing, but uh, we can even in the general case of combustion, we can give some kind of a meaning to the, this mixture fraction. So this mix, mixture fraction is actually mass of material coming from the fuel stream divided by mass of mix. So we did not define this before, so I am just writing it now, so this is Z and what that means is that there is some fuel stuff, we call it fuel stuff, kg of fuel stuff divided by kg of mixture. What is fuel stuff? Fuel stuff is like carbon, hydrogen which are coming from the fuel okay. and this can be written as kg of fuel stuff. Plus, there is actually another term and I am running out of space, so I will have to write that term on the next page. So this term, this additional term is kg of fuel stuff divided by kg of products. kg of mixture. So this is just a manipulation like this is the original definition this one, oh. yeah this one. We starting from here we are breaking it up in such a way that we get three mass fractions all right. So this is the same as this plus this plus this three times. So you will notice that this is getting cancelled with this, this is getting cancelled with this, this is getting cancelled with this. This is the trick that we are playing. We will get three terms. Yeah, we will get uh, three terms, okay. We will get, so this is the first term, this is the second term, this is the three term. So this basic thing we have 
broken up into three terms. Yeah, let's let's do one more step and it will become clear in this. So this will be one into yf plus zero into y oxidizer plus one over s plus one into y products. Okay. <coughs> so, what this means for example, kg of fuel stuff divided by fuel is that <coughs> if the fuel has only fuel, then this number is equal to 1. So, That is why we got 1 here assuming that the fuel has only fuel. What about kg of fuel stuff divided by kg of oxidizer? It means we are asking this question do we have fuel stuff that is carbon and hydrogen in the oxidizer? We can have in the oxidizer see we are thinking of two streams. So, one stream has can have fuel and oxidizer the other stream can also have fuel and oxidizer, but we are not taking that example. We are taking an easier example. So, since we are taking that easier example, kg of fuel st uh, stuff divided by kg of oxidizer will be 0. All right. So, this is in the oxidizer how much kg of fuel is there. And what about kg of fuel stuff this one uh, the last one. Kg of fuel stuff divided uh, no, this is done. Uh, kg of fuel stuff divided by kvg of products. How do I write this to be 1 over s plus 1? That is because fuel plus s oxidizer is actually products, is not it? So, 1 kg here, s kg here will give you 1, will give you s plus 1 kg of products. So, we are saying that we are burning 1 kg of fuel with s kg of oxidizer to give you s plus 1 kg of products. So, that is why this term is 1 over s plus 1. So, we are asking this question that out what is the number of kgs of products? What is the answer? s plus 1. Out of that, how much is coming from the fuel? Has to be 1 kg, is not it? How do we know from here? He, this equation, we, we have the definition of s, remember? We have the definition of f, s and if you do not remember right now, it is like this, is not it? CH4 plus 2 times O2 plus 3.76 N2. This is what we are doing or, or let us keep the nitrogen out. Let us just write this one. This we have done before, is not it? So, this is uh, how much? 64 and this is 16. So, if it is 1, this is 4, right? If this is 1, this is 4, the products and we are not making a distinction amongst the products CO2, H2 or whatever is getting produced. The products have to be 1 plus 4 that is 5 kg. Okay, there is no other option. So, that is why this is 1 over S plus 1. This S is small s. <laughs> so, this is the mass ratio. Maybe I should take more precaution and write it like this then it becomes a small s, is not it? So, this is not definitely not that capital S which we have in the formula for flame length, definitely not that. So, this gives you this z which is mixture fraction and this mixture fraction <coughs> is from the last page it is y f 
plus 1 over s plus 1 y products. The y oxidizer term is not there. Y oxidizer term is not there, correct? Because there is no fuel stuff in the oxidizer. Because we are talking about that, that case. Now, I do not like Y product because we have been do, dealing with Y fuel and Y oxidizer so far. So, yeah, just one more thing that this will not matter, but let, let me write this as, let us write this as YO because we have been writing with YO. So, let us not write Y oxidizer. So, YO, in, in any case, it is getting dropped out, 0 here, does not matter. So, this is YF plus 1 over S plus 1 into what is Y product? Y product is 1 minus YF minus YO, correct? So, you have streams. So, you have this stream here, this other stream here and anywhere you go within the domain, there are only three species. So, Y fuel plus Y oxidizer plus Y product is always equal to 1. That is why I am being able to write this. So, this will tell you. So, from here we get Z equal to S plus 1 here, S Y F plus Y F plus 1 minus Y F minus Y O here, from here. So, the Y F gets cancelled and you get Z as S plus 1, S Y F plus 1 minus Y O, this is our Z. So, this is actually similar, but a simpler version of what we had already written for Z. So, what was the Z that we had written some time back? The Z that we had written some time back when establishing the mixture fraction, some time back. What was that Z? That Z was This was the old one, okay. And here we we have got the same thing basically, but for a simpler case, which is S Y F plus one minus Y O. Let me write this as let me write this as S Y F minus Y O plus one divided by S plus 1. So, this is the um, first time when we saw Z some time back and this is today. Why is there a difference? The difference is because we actually are setting y no y o not equal to 1 and y f not equal to 1. We are taking a simpler case. Now, just to remind you what is y f not and what is y o not? <coughs> These are the fuel mass fraction and the oxidizer mass fraction in the in their individual streams. So, if you take both them both of them to be 1, then you get from this in any case you get this which we just now derived. So, what is the purpose of all this? It tells us that it is ok to say that Z is actually mass of fuel stuff that is it is like mass of fuel stuff divided by mass of mixture that is mass of material which is coming from the fuel stream divided by the mass of mixture. So, this is an interpretation of Z. Okay. Hmm. 
But hmm. we are conceding all the uh, oxidative stream and uh, product of hmm. So, this is a contribution of the fuel stream. The question here is like where is the oxidizer stream coming into the picture? Now, Z is Z takes care of the stuff that is like carbon and hydrogen etcetera which are originating from the fuel. The mass of that divided by the mass of the mixture. Now, if you think about it, here also, so this is let us say fuel stream and this is the oxidizer stream. If you come here, it has a contribution from the fuel like carbon, hydrogen etcetera. It has other things also, it has contribution from the oxidizer also. So, it has oxygen also. In general, any, if you take any block here, it will have oxygen, it will have carbon, it will have hydrogen, it will have these things. But Z is actually that contribution which is coming from the fuel material, the carbon hydrogen per unit mass of the mixture. That is the interpretation. So, it is not, uh, it's, it does not explicitly write the oxidizer contribution. So, it is it is relating to the fuel contribution to the mass of the mixture. It is the fuel contribution to the mass of the mixture. So, that is how we are defining it. So, this becomes easier to interpret actually uh, I think we are running out of time today. Uh, it becomes maybe what we can do is in the next class uh, that is on Monday. We will try to if we can to understand this better we can actually try to do a simpler case where there is just mixing happening. So, here what we have done here is more general, but suppose there are fuel and oxidizer coming and they are not reacting, okay, just a mixing case. Then it is easier to interpret mixture fraction. So, maybe if you think about this one, so we will start from here and then we can also do, if there are more questions, then we can also do the mixing problem. But one final comment before we close today is that if you look at the expressions that we have got for mixture fraction, uh, yeah. yeah, either this or this, you will understand that mixture fraction is actually Z is a composite mass fraction. That is to some extent helpful, but it the physical interpretation actually we have to go further than that. Physical inter interpretation was that kg of fuel stuff divided by kg of mixture, but Z is a composite mass fraction. What do we mean by that? See, it is a combination of Y f and Y u. It is actually a linear combination of Y f and Y u. It is a composite mass fraction, it is some kind of a mass fraction. It is a clever choice of combination of mass fractions which will eliminate that source term. All right, I think we ran out of time today. So, we will start from here in the next class. Thank you.